Hi, I'm Ron Timmermans from the Florida Aviation Network, one of the many hosts here, and we're broadcasting live and in the clear today from the EAA, excuse me, from the Sun and Fun campus at Lakeland, Florida. This is the 48th annual Sun and Fun Aerospace Expo. I'm sure I get that all correct here. 48 years uh, in a row, uh, with one exception of a couple years ago with COVID, but we're back again this year, a great attendance this year. If you're watching on live stream video, that means you're probably not here at the moment, but I hope you're coming tomorrow or the next day or somewhere at the, before the end of the week. And if you aren't able to make it this year to Sun and Fun, start making your plans for next year, 2023. You need to be at Sun and Fun. It is like spring break for pilots and everybody having to do with aviation. So um, the Florida Aviation Network does a number of interviews throughout the week, uh, live streamed interviews from our, uh, our temporary studio here in the uh, Central Florida, Florida Aerospace Academy uh, High School building. And uh, we're delighted to um, host uh, a number of folks that we do some interesting interviews with. One of them is uh, Mr. Gary Reeves, who's joining me today. Gary Reeves, thank you for joining us today. Good to see you again, it's, Ron. It's always good, to have, uh, good, always good to have you here. Gary is, um, is a pilot, of course, and a flight instructor, a flight instructor extraordinaire. Uh, among other uh, accolades and accomplishments, Gary was uh, selected as the central, um, excuse me, certif certificated flight instructor of the year for 2019. Uh, uh, quite, an, uh, quite an accomplishment, of course. And he has his own firm called uh, pilotsafety.org, and it's all about training and making pilots safer. And, that's obviously important to all of us. It's important to the Florida Aviation Network. It's one of our fundamental things. Everything we do has to do with, with safety. And Gary, I know that's uh, an underlying uh, foundation of your organization and, and all of the uh, products that, uh, that you uh, put out. So tell us a little bit about uh, yourself, Gary. How many hours have you flown and how many hours of instruction? And Well, I've got uh, not a ton of time. I have uh, just a little bit over 8,300 hours. And uh, almost all of it is dual given. I uh, got a private pilot just as a hobby, got my instrument rating because I got rained out and fogged out of a couple dates, got a commercial pilot because I was bored, sold a company and had nothing to do, and went to, uh, do you remember ATP? I do. I uh, used to be able, and this is a long time ago, folks, used to be able to do your CFI, double I, and MEI in 10 days in Las Vegas. So I had money and no job, and I went to Vegas. and. Well, I'll get my flight instructor, and I never want to teach for a living. I, I do other things, but I'll just do it as a hobby. And then uh, I did one flight lesson, stepped out of a 172, and somebody gave me money for being in the airplane. And I haven't done anything else for 16 years. Wow. So let me make sure I got this uh, couch right. You went to Las Vegas with a pocket full of money and time on your hands, and you decided to do flight training. Yeah, I just wanted to get my CFI double I, I, mean, I to be a better pilot. I'm just pointing out that that's not something most people do with a pocket full of money when they go to Las Vegas. So you are truly unique, Gary. Well, I figured if I gave money to ATP, I would get something back. Ah, as versus opposed a to free putting buffet. in a machine. Yeah. Right. <laughs> exactly. When you would never see it again. Yeah. So how long ago was this, did you say? Uh, let's think. Uh, I think I got my CFI uh, January 2004. Okay, so not that long ago, yeah, less no. than 20 years ago. Yeah. And you've accumulated over 8,000 hours. Yeah, a little over 8,300 and almost all of it dual. Wow, yeah. wow. Uh, just for the record, I also have about 8,300, 8,200 hours and change, and it's taken me 50 years to get to that point. Uh, but like you, Gary, I've got, uh, most of mine is now dual instruction as right. well, instruction given. So I find it to be very fulfilling, and it is kind of unique in that, um, People pay us to do that, to go fly around in airplanes with them and give them uh, help and assistance. I, I was so blown away. I paid so much money to rent planes, and I paid instructors to let me fly planes, and then somebody gave me money, and I went, This is oh, good. Oh, I could do this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I, I never thought I'd so, be here. So Gary makes light of it um, a bit, but he is an excellent instructor because I have been to several of your ground training uh, presentations. I haven't had a chance to fly with you as an instructor yet. Maybe someday I would hope, but your ground training is excellent. Preparation is fabulous. He's got knowledge uh, that is uh, more than a mile wide and certainly more than a mile deep as well. He really knows his stuff. 
particularly having to do with avionics and instrument flying and the like. And so if, you, if you've attended one of Gary's courses, you know exactly what I'm saying, how good he is at instructing. If you haven't attended one of his, his uh, courses, then perhaps you have uh, seen one of his uh, videos and, and uh, one of his many videos that he has uh, on flying IFR and um, GPS and using ForeFlight and just a host of different subjects that uh, you uh, seem to be have an expertise on and just uh, in, in any one of them. So, uh, Gary, how long have you been in this uh, pilotsafety.org uh, business? Well, I owned a big flight school in Los Angeles and uh, very much enjoyed it. But I found that uh, I've always had a niche for computers. I was always just good at computers. My dad taught me computers when I was a kid. Uh, and so I was always fascinating by uh, Garmin. Garmin really kind of revolutionized the world with the Garmin 430, 530, and the G1000. So I, I, I found that I was actually really good at working Garmin and autopilots and you know the Avidyne systems. And I just kind of found my niche was for flight and anything to do with computers. So what I found is uh, at the flight school in Long Beach, another instructor who was amazing instructor, much better than I would ever be at training people for check rides. Uh, would send me his students before a check ride because he didn't do GPS. He just, he really? didn't do GPS, he didn't wanna learn GPS. So hey, Gary's great at GPS. Before you take the check ride, because you have a Garmin 430 in your airplane, go spend three lessons with Gary. And I'm like, well, maybe I could just do a niche. So I started pilotsafety.org originally just to reduce GA accidents. And I have kind of a lofty goal. I want to lower the general aviation fatality rate to zero. That is a lofty goal, and it is also a realistic goal, and I certainly support that. So I focused on stuff I knew, but then I started focusing just on the best ways to use Garmin, Avidyne, autopilots like Genesis S-Tech, and ForeFlight for single pilot IFR, because that's what I was good at. Yeah. And, it, and I really, you know, with 16 years of doing it, I think the biggest difference between me and the local flight instructors, the local flight instructors are so much better than me at preparing people for check rides, because I don't do that. Somebody asked if I would do their commercial training, and I'm like, oh, I would be horrible. I don't think I could even spell Shondell. <laughs> I know I couldn't do one. Um, yes, you could. You did one at least one when for your uh, commercial. Oh, oh I'm ride. sure I did. But is that the curving climb? It I, is. I don't know. It is. Um, I would. I would. I would need your help. But I really just I focused on a niche, and that's what I would encourage all flight instructors to do that want to go career. Don't try and be everything to everybody. Don't say yes to every client. Become the twin Cessna king or queen. Become the cross-country planning king or queen. Focus on something that nobody else does. Don't, don't ever try and do what somebody else is doing, right? Find your niche and be great at it. I like to joke that according to the awards and according to people, I'm the world's greatest at IFR using technology. What they don't know is the 300,000 things I'm really bad at. Like I'm only good because I focus on that. Okay, so we should probably just keep the not so good things secret. Or you can tell people. Okay, all right, my, I my, will. <laughs> my favorite thing to do is when people give me a referral and they say, hey Gary, would you do this? My favorite thing as an instructor to say is, no, I would be really bad at that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and, and, but give them a referral to somebody who is Exactly, good. so honesty is probably a very good thing for yeah. you. So uh, Gary, you're an instructor, I'm an instructor, Let's do a little role playing okay. now, as if we were going to help someone with, um, oh, I don't know, IFR alternatives, uh, alternate okay. airports. So there's that uh, one, two, three rule. Uh, how would you um, coach somebody on that, and how would you tell them how to do that whole thing? Can we put up a disclaimer that this is a Gary opinion only, and in, in, in no way represents you know anybody of importance? Oh, so you're not with the FAA. I'm a lead rep for the FAA safety team as a volunteer, and no, I probably, they probably don't even want me to tell you that. <laughs> so do you remember uh, that the rule was based on that one, two, three thing, right? An hour before or an hour after if the visibility was below 
right? One hour before, one hour after, if the ceiling's below 2,000, or visibility's two. less than three, That's the you three. have to pick an alternate airport exactly. that you go to after you've already flown for two and a half hours, after you're in bad weather, you've tried an approach that's below minimums, and you're tired, and now you should try and go somewhere else. Yeah. Well, but that, that's all in the planning stage, right? At yeah. At the flight planning stage? But that seems like such a bad idea. Okay. So Why is that? Well, the biggest killer of pilots is something actually called decision fatigue. And it's a, it's a science, and there's stuff in my book about it, but we know that your decisions go downhill very quickly when you're scared or stressed, and after you've been making lots of them. So that rule probably saved a lot of lives when we didn't have weather in the cockpit. Do you remember we used to have the FA, the area forecast? I do. So 20 years ago when I got my instrument rating, we didn't have good weather. We had this eight hour old, this is what we think in the next three states, maybe type of weather. So you always planned an alternate because you didn't know what the weather would be when you got to like Oakland or, or Dallas. But we have so much better weather. In. So what I tell people is really great instructors teach the one, two, three rule because really great examiners test on the one, two, three rule because that's the rule. But with modern weather, if you've got four flight in the cockpit so hooked up to a Stratus three, or you've got an Avidyne FMS or a Garmin GPS with data link weather, the way I want to pick alternates totally disagrees with the FAA. I have, I have a totally different opinion. I think this, and maybe the best way to explain it is, can I ask you a true or false question? Yes, you can. Ron, true or false? Everybody that ever died by flowing into known bad weather, doing an approach below their personal minimums, and having a fatal outcome would have lived if they'd stopped halfway to their destination while they were still in good weather. I would say true. So my recommendation is that your alternate should always be halfway to your destination, and I prefer a Class Charlie Airport. The problem is, is if you're studying for IFR, and you're studying for the written test, or you're a good instrument instructor, that may kind of cause issues on four flight or with the examiner, because they're gonna say, well, you don't have enough gas to go to Tulsa, do an approach, and go all the way back to Oklahoma City, it doesn't qualify as a legal alternate. And you go, but yeah, but I wouldn't go into the bad weather. So I have a thing called a weather alternate. I would like the alternate halfway on every cross country and stop before you get into bad weather. Or make that your decision point. Do a I weather decision to... point. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Right. And then exactly. I do recommend a second alternate, which is the very closest runway to your destination. But you wouldn't do that in case of weather, you just do that in case the runway's closed. Exactly, exactly. And four flight allows you to put in two alternates. Absolutely. And so why not do that? And then um, I was also gonna point out that relative to the one, two, three rule, which dictates whether or not we need to list an alternate on our, on our flight, on our IFR flight plan, I have uh, adopted a personal habit of always choosing an alternate. Even if, the, even if on this IFR flight plan, it, I know it's going to be VFR weather, the whole time I will, I'm in the habit of putting down an alternate. That way I, I never have to do the one, two, three rule. I've always, uh, always chosen an alternate. And like Gary, I like to look at where is potential weather and an alternate on this side of my destination makes a whole lot more sense for the very reasons that Gary mentioned. Make your decision, make that your weather decision point, whether or not to continue to your destination or say, hey, it's not a good idea. Why don't I just land here at this alternate, maybe halfway or uh, at least on this side of my, my destination. So those are always, always good things. Uh, students that I've worked with um, in IFR training, Gary, uh, have trouble with this one, two, three rule. Some of them, sure. you know, trying to memorize it for the, for the um, examiner and the like. And I just say, you know, why try and memorize that in your actual flying? Just Always use an alternate. It's so simple uh, on four flight now. You can touch the alternate thing, and it'll give you the nearest airports uh, to your destination, which is maybe good for the second alternate, as you said, and then choose another one uh, as well. And so it's just a good habit to be in, and I, I keep purporting that to, to students with whom I fly, and I think it, it makes some good sense because what we're trying to do is make us safer pilots and make our endeavors uh, ever, ever so much safer. All right, so anything else on alternates, Gary? Well, I just love what you said, and I think everybody should adopt that. 
So a billion, billion years ago, I went to paramedic school. And I actually learned the definition of an emergency. So if you were outside and you saw a, a cute little redhead girl, pigtails, Pippi Longstocking. And folks, if you don't know who Pippi Longstocking is, find an old person, they'll explain the reference. But if you saw a cute little four-year-old girl choking on a hot dog, not breathing at all, is that an emergency? No, not to me. I went to paramedic school. I'll walk over, I'll pick up the Heimlich, take the hot dog out, give it to the mom and go, don't feed the kid hot dogs and keep going. <laughs> but would it be an emergency to the little girl? Yes. Would it be an emergency to the mom? Most likely if she wasn't a trained paramedic. Because they're not trained for it. So what you said is so brilliant. If you pick an alternate every time, even when you don't legally need one, you are prepared if something goes wrong and it's already kind of set up that you would divert there. That's going to save a lot of lives because it, it, it puts it into the, your consciousness that if anything goes wrong, I'll stop here. Yeah. If they don't plan an alternate because they didn't have to and something goes wrong in flight, then they get stuck. Indeed. Then it can become an emergency. Gary, let me shift gears just a moment because uh, sure. we got just a few minutes left for this interview. So I was with a client the other day and he had an IFR GPS navigator in the, in the panel. And uh, I noticed one of the buttons uh, had no label on it, no label at all. And I asked him, I said, so what is this button for? He said, oh, that's the direct to button. I said, well, how come there's not the little D with the arrow on it on the button? And the reason was, what do you think, Gary? Because it had been worn off. Yeah, it worn off because he had kept pushing that all the time. So is that a great idea among pilots flying IFR or even VFR using an IFR navigator? Well, there's a computer saying called GIGO. And uh, are you familiar with GIGO? Garbage in, garbage out. So if this is the airport you're going to, IFR, does this make sense to you? Fly direct to the center of the airport, then turn around and go back and start an instrument approach. No, that's foolish. That'd be way out of context. So for most of the time, flying Victor Airways is not technically the best way. There's lots of exceptions. Yeah, there are. You know, you know, the tech route's very busy, Bravo Airspace Mountain Sierra. But for most IFR trips, Victor Airways are not the best. But a lot of people go, well, just file GPS Direct. That doesn't make sense to me. It's actually dangerous. GPS Direct to an airport doesn't make sense. So what I promote is always, if there's a SID or a STAR, always use the SID and the STAR. But if there's not an arrival, what I would prefer, and what I teach all my clients, is you actually file direct to the initial approach fix for the approach you expect to use when you get there. Because then you're set up. So some people go, well, how do you know what approach until you hear the ATIS? Well, I, I got a weather briefing. I know what the winds are going to be. And I think one of the most common misconceptions is if you hear on the ATIS that the ILS approach is in use, that's what you should fly. Well, no. The LPV approach is always more stable. It's always better. The ILS is on the ATIS because it's the lowest common denominator. So let's say I'm going from Oklahoma City to Decatur, Texas. I wouldn't file direct to Decatur, Texas. I would file direct to Zoom Key which is the initial approach fix for the RNAV-17 at Decatur. Mm -hmm. And something amazing happens when you do that. What would that be? I check into Fort Worth Center, and I say, Fort Worth Center, whatever airplane I'm flying that day. Station Air 49 or 41 Foxtrot, level 6000, direct zoom key, RNAV-17, full stop Decatur with the current weather and no TAMs. So when you sign on with the next controller, who will likely be your last controller before the airport, you tell them immediately what you're planning to do. Yeah. And what is their normal response? Cleared for the approach and thanks for the information. Exactly. How efficient is that? That is, that is the, uh, the ultimate of efficiency where you tell the controller exactly what you want to do, respectfully of course, and the controller is relieved because now they don't have to guess what you're going to do or ask you what you're going to do. You've already told them. And so I've adopted the same thing, Gary, perhaps uh, partly from suggestions I've heard from you in the past and other things that I've figured out on my own. Uh, that's, that's the way to do it. I, I tell the controllers what I expect to do and almost always I get cleared as, cleared as requested or cleared that, uh, that clearance uh, approved and the like. And that really makes it uh, work. So going direct to, maybe there's a time for direct to, maybe as you're getting vectored for an approach 
uh, and instead of um, uh, vectors to final, if they give you direct to zoom key, if that's initial approach mm -hmm. fix, uh, then maybe push direct to on, on that one. But uh, for the most part, well, in your case, you're already going direct to, so, or, I mean, you're going flight plan to it. Right, and you know, I actually do that even when ATC tries to help. Oftentimes on a long cross country, a controller will say, clear direct destination. Uh -huh. Well, I don't want to go direct destination. I want to go direct to my initial approach fix. Yeah. So I always accept it. If ATC wants to give me a shortcut, read it back, I'm clear direct destination, but I don't use my autopilot direct to. I actually set my heading bug to direct to the destination, put my autopilot in heading mode. Uh -huh. Then I hit direct to the initial approach fix, but I don't activate it, and I say direct to destination request. And speaking of shortcuts, that has to be our, uh, our last comment today. We are out of time, but thank you very much, um, Gary, for um, uh, being part of our uh, interview uh, folks today. This has been great to uh, chat with you and uh, share some ideas and stories about uh, flying and, and uh, making pilots safer. Uh, Gary <coughs> Reeves with uh, pilotsafety.org, uh, you will see him here at uh, Sun and Fun and elsewhere at other air shows giving presentations, selling uh, uh, safety material and the like. Thank you for joining us. I'm Ron Timmermans of the Florida Aviation Network. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you at the next interview.